We tend to think of cars in either premium or volume terms. Here, though, is one that could comfortably fit within either definition, the 8th generation Volkswagen Passat, usefully improved in this updated form. Though targeted at the mainstream part of the medium-range Mondeo Class D segment, it's long had an appeal stretching beyond, up towards the premium mid-sized executive saloon class. Global buyers like that, and the result is a worldwide favourite the Wolfsburg maker simply can't afford to get wrong. Hence the subtle changes made to this enhanced B8 series design, which include improved engineering, extra driver assist technology, updated media connectivity and smarter looks. Volkswagen's Passat is a car that has always played a very deft hand, bridging the gap between the mainstream and the premium marks, while delivering comfort and value that's often market leading. It's why the Passat has long been Volkswagen's most successful nameplate, and the reason why Wolfsburg couldn't afford to get Generation 8 wrong. They didn't. But time's moved on since its initial launch in 2014, and four years later, an update to this B8 series car was needed, the revised model that we're going to look at here. As much as we like to think that the automotive world revolves around this sector dial, the truth is somewhat different. Here we hold up the BMW 3 Series as the paragon of success when it comes to a mid-sized D-segment saloon or estate able to build sales volumes on the back of premium build quality. But in global terms, the 3 Series is a bit part player compared to Volkswagen's Passat. How successful is this VW? You might want to sit down for this one. It sells more than the entire product lineups of BMW or Audi. Fully 1.1 million cars a year, with China and the US the biggest recipients. It's been on sale since 1972, so actually predates the Golf by a couple of years. And since then, over 30 million Passats have been sold. While other manufacturers have been persuaded that models of this kind should be able to drive on their door handles, Volkswagen knows what its customer base really needs. A car that will lower the heartbeat rather than raise it. And as with any company that really knows its market, the rewards have been considerable. Today, as every day, over 3,000 new Passats will be sold across the world, with a new owner taking delivery every 29 seconds. It all makes this the company's best-selling global model. It's a phenomenon, no longer simply an integral part of the Volkswagen range. It's now pretty much a brand in itself. The danger of such success is that it can result in an overly conservative approach when the time comes for changes. This lightly facelifted version of the Mark 8 model, announced in the spring of 2019, certainly doesn't look too much different to the original, either outside or in. Actually, though, quite a lot's gone on here in terms of updates, especially beneath the bonnet, where there's an all-new 150 PS diesel engine for the volume variant and a significant 30% increase in electrified driving range for this GTE petrol plug-in version. Plus, the car now features arguably the most sophisticated semi-autonomous driving technology in the segment. As before, more Passat people will choose the spacious estate body style than this saloon version. In which case, they'll also have the opportunity to consider an SUV-style all-track variant, which uses the full-motion four-wheel drive system fitted to the more powerful versions of more conventional models. So, will it all be enough to keep this car ahead of the chasing pack? Time to find out. Volkswagen is very good at creating a premium driving experience. It always has been with the Passat. So it is perhaps appropriate that the revised version of this 8th generation model was the first car in the company's range to showcase a whole new generation of media and driving assist technology. Which clues you up for what you're in for here a driving experience that in every way is prioritised towards laid-back comfort, exactly as a typical Passat user would want. We'll get to that after we've covered the two key engine updates that feature here. 
Arguably the most significant one is the introduction of the new generation Evo series 2 litre TDI 150 PS diesel unit, which with either a 6 speed manual or a 7 speed DSG auto transmission will be the power plant that the majority of Passat buyers will want. Cylinder deactivation features here for the first time in a black pump fueled Volkswagen Group engine. All part of a complete TDI redesign that's also delivered new exhaust, turbo, fuel injection and thermos management systems. Collectively these changes are enough to make this power plant actually more efficient than the continuing smaller feebler 1.6 litre TDI 120 PS diesel unit. Yet performance is much as it was in the older tech 2 litre TDI 150 PS engine used in the pre-facelift range. 340 newton metres of torque allowing effortless pulling power facilitating a rest to 62 miles an hour for the DSG version of 9.1 seconds en route to 130 miles miles an hour. So Volkswagen still believes in diesel but the brand is also realistic enough to know that ultimately the days are numbered for this power source. In large part this is because of the increased appeal of electrified petrol engines. Surprisingly this facelifted 8th generation Passat doesn't introduce the mild hybrid 12 volt technology now on offer in this car's Audi A4 cousin but it does deliver a much improved version of the plug-in hybrid powertrain that the GTE version of this B8 series model featured previously and we thought that we'd try it as part of this test. Volkswagen can't yet justify completely redesigning this power plant so as before it's based around mechanicals that the brand has, no longer uses in its conventional models a uh, 1.4 litre TSI petrol engine and a DSG auto gearbox with only six speeds. The engineers have though given this plug-in package a bigger battery up from 9.9 .9 to 13 kilowatt hours which has improved this variant's electrified driving range by around 30 percent or by around 12 miles. It's now WLTP rated at 36 miles though we found that 30 miles is more typical in real world use. Various selectable settings govern the way that the GTE's powertrain works. The car always starts off in fully electrified E mode before switching to a now reconfigured hybrid mode that sees the electric motor and the combustion engine combining together. Or you can stay in E mode if you want to if you're in an urban situation. As part of the hybrid setting you've also a battery hold option that will save battery charge until later in your trip and a battery charge setting in which the battery will be charged as you drive by the TSI engine. There's also a press on engine only GTE mode, the latter enabling a potential 62 mile an hour sprint time of 7.4 seconds en route to 138 miles an hour. For completion we'll brief you on the other engine options in the range. Uh, two more petrols and three more diesels, all of them of more minority interest and all of them available uh, only with a seven speed DSG auto gearbox, a transmission that uh, here as with other Volkswagen Group models we found to be a little jerky when used at low speeds. If frugality is everything and you can't stretch to the GTE plug-in hybrid you'll be drawn to the base 1.6 litre TDI 120 PS diesel unit that we mentioned earlier though its performance will feel distinctly leisurely the official figures are rest to 62 miles an hour in 11.3 seconds on the way to 127 miles an hour there are also a couple of 190 PS Passat variants both of which get to 62 miles an hour in a fraction under 8 seconds on the way to a top speed of just under 150 miles an hour. One is green pump fueled, the 2 litre TSI petrol, the other is a 2 litre TDI 190 PS diesel, this the older non-Evo generation unit which will probably be the choice of towers. First because it develops a lusty 400 newton meters of torque and second because it can be ordered with the option of all-wheel drive in which form it can tug along up to 2.2 tons. The 2 litre TDI 190 PS diesel and 4 motion all wheel drive combination is the one you have to have if you're to choose the all track estate version of this Passat which features a 27.5mm ride height increase, off road suspension and an off road setting driving mode that includes hill descent assist for slippery slopes.
All-wheel drive is mandatory for the two rare flagship engines in the range, both of which remain four cylinders in size. One's a diesel, the by TDI 240 PS unit capable of 62 miles an hour in 6.7 seconds on the way to 150 miles an hour. And the other is petrol powered, the 272 PS version of the 2 litre TSI petrol unit, which creates a really understated performance model able to reach 62 miles an hour in just 5.8 seconds. And were it not for a 155 mile an hour speed limiter, the car would certainly manage 160 to 170 mile an hour autobahn speeds. In theory, Volkswagen doesn't offer a high-performance Passat sports derivative, but these two top variants get pretty close to being just that. No version of this car, though, is able to offer up a really memorable handling package. Typical Passat owners would probably be mystified as to why such a thing would ever be needed. For them, a model of this kind is there for the journey, not for the way that it should be driven. Those who disagree and find themselves in search of a car in the mainstream part of this sector will find that a Mondeo or a Mazda 6 will better suit their needs. Even if you're minded to prefer a car of that sort, it's also worth trying this one, for its other attributes are telling. On a typical British B-road, this Passat just flows beautifully. Yes, there's a touch more body roll than some rivals exhibit, but for the most part, it's expertly disguised by a supple, languid rhythm that soon has you covering ground in a quick, safe and relaxing manner, aided by accurate, if not especially feelsome, steering. Long distances melt away in Jaguar or Lexus style, helped by the exemplary refinement and the superbly supportive Ego Comfort seats. Think in terms of a model that's smooth, refined and low stress in this segment, and you'd have to start here first. It's a formula Volkswagen has perfected over many years with this car, and they'd be mad to divert from it. The Wolfsburg maker does, though, invite a little more driver involvement in the whole dynamic process these days. There are no chassis or suspension changes with this revised B8 model, but as before, there's an optional XDS electronic differential lock system that aids corner turn-in, and you can specify firmer sports suspension if you're really determined to ruin the ride. A better damping option is the extra cost DCC dynamic chassis control system that we're trying here, which adjusts ride comfort through four settings, eco, sport, normal and individual. It's one of the better damping systems out there, but whether it's really worth the extra that Volkswagen wants for it on all but the most powerful petrol and diesel engines is debatable. After all, this car's standard ride package doesn't really need fiddling with, almost class leading as it is over poor and broken services, helped by this 8th generation model's sophisticated MQB chassis. Earlier we mentioned the fresh generation of drive assist technology that's been ushered in by this revised model, so let's finish this section by briefing you on that. What's important to understand here is the switch from passive to active technology. Previously the ACC adaptive chassis control system, now standard across the range, uh, merely braked and accelerated the car based around a preset speed. Now it uses the car's front camera system, GPS data and a whole host of sensors to drive the car predictively. So when ACC is set, the car knows in advance about bends, roundabouts and upcoming traffic flow, plus the Passat will adapt itself to speed limits as you enter them. Adaptive cruise control is also an integral part of this car's clever new travel assist system, which enables partially assisted so-called level two autonomous driving. The pre-facelifted model's traffic jam assist setup, which continues here, had an element of this pairing ACC technology with lane assist adaptive lane guidance so that the car could effectively drive itself in traffic queues. But because that tech could only work at up to 37 miles an hour, it was only good for urban conditions. So Volkswagen has developed travel assist from it, which also works with ACC and lane assist, but provides partially assisted driving at highway speeds of up to 130 miles an hour. 
That's made possible by the integration of the predictive technology we just mentioned and the addition here of a new capacitive steering wheel which has to sense your hands upon its rim otherwise if warnings are ignored it'll disable all the drive systems and bring the car to a gradual stop at the side of the road. This is all the kind of technology we think a typical buyer of this model will really like. Very Volkswagen and perfectly Passat. The Passat has never been a trendy follower of fashion. Rarely has this model ever caused heads to turn or hearts to miss a beat. For all that though, it's remained quietly fashionable throughout eight generations and five decades of life, with understated yet sophisticated styling that confidently holds its own in almost any company car park. That's fine for lording it over volume brand Mondeo market rivals, but it's never been quite enough to lure many buyers away from the premium pavement presence of D-segment models from BMW, Audi or Mercedes. In the future, with the Passat model line, we can expect that to change. And even now, with this lightly revised version of the Mark 8 B8 series design, there are signs that Volkswagen is starting to imbue this car with a little more premium DNA. Here at the front, for instance, these smarter LED headlights add extra overtaking presence and the reshaped lower fog lamps incorporated into the revised bumper look more sophisticated. The lightly updated radiator grille exudes a more polished presence too, its purpose being to emphasise the car's width and with the swept back windscreen and low bonnet line create a lower, wider and more expensive look. This GTE plug-in variant aims to set itself apart a little with unique C signature front LED daytime running lights in the bumper which replace the usual fog lamps. Top models like this one also get the brand's latest IQ light LED matrix headlamps which incorporate 32 individually controllable LEDs that automatically activate, adapting to road conditions and vehicles around you based on signals from the front camera and the GPS navigation system that also take into account steering angle and vehicle speed. There are no changes at the side unless you count the addition of fresh paint colours like lapis blue, bottle green and aurora gold and new wheel styles across the 17, 18 and 19 inch wheel sizes. We've got 18 inch Monterey rims here fitted with the blue brake calipers that mark out this GTE version. To be fair, few profile updates were really needed. Both saloon and estate models look better proportioned than they did in their previous generation forms, thanks to short overhangs that emphasise the way that the wheels have been moved right out to the corners of the car to suit this Mark 8 version's wider track. The estate variant is 16mm longer than this saloon. As before, the silhouette is all sharp angles and chamfered edges, with the profile nicely set off by this sharp character line that runs from front to rear, precisely bisecting the door handles. It's at the rear that this revised version of this 8th generation Passat is most clearly identifiable as an updated model. These restyled LED tail lamps are noticeably different and rather classier than those that featured on the original version of this design. The centrally located Passat lettering is different too, as is the bumper. As before, on this saloon model, the flared shoulder of the C-pillar transitions into a large boot lid that continues the low and wide styling theme. And also as before, under the skin lies the MQB platform this car shares with its close segment cousins, the Skoda Superb and the Audi A4, a chassis that made the largest contribution to the 85 kilogram saving in weight that this eighth generation model gained over its predecessor. Time to move inside, the doors closing with the kind of quality humph you'd only get from a premium design. Many Volkswagen Group models tend to sell on the upfront experience that they offer and this one's no different. There's no question that this is a high-end place to be. Forget comparisons with Mondeo and Insignia segment rivals, what we have here is a cabin every bit as good as that you'd find in a far pricier compact executive saloon like Audi's A4 or BMW 3 Series. 
Now, you wouldn't expect any of the fundamental elements to have been changed as part of a mid-term refresh, nor have they been. Klaus Bischoff's design team instead contenting themselves with updating the steering wheel, restyling the door trims, uh, revising the instruments and adding a few fresh trim finishes and fabrics. As before, the minimalist dashboard is dominated by one long vent with sleek integrated chrome fins that extend across the entire width of the fascia like a band. Previously, a classy analogue clock was placed in the central part of the span, but now, disappointingly, that's been replaced by a piece of plastic with a Passat logo and a hazard warning button. Volkswagen says this gives more of a contemporary appearance, but it smacks a bit more of cost saving to us. Which is a pity, because everything else feels very nice indeed. The usual brushed aluminium trim, uh, satin chromed switch gear and piano black inlays feature and build quality from the German Emden factory is predictably faultless. All of it there to subtly reinforce the impression that Volkswagen has premium aspirations here. Just to make sure though, Volkswagen has gone the extra mile with technology, primarily with cabin screen tech. This centre dash monitor showcases the third generation MIB3 version of the brand's modular infotainment matrix display, which at first glance might not appear to be much different from the previous setup. With most Passat variants, you'll get this as an 8-inch Discover navigation screen, though on base trim versions without SatNav, there's a smaller 6.5-inch display. Further up the range, you can opt for this largest size 9.2-inch Discover Navigation Pro monitor, which unfortunately does without the physical knobs of the other screens, but does feature additions like a 64GB SSD hard drive, 3D mapping, and a new, more intuitive Hello Volkswagen natural voice control system for online use of the phone and GPS functions. Whatever infotainment package you select, you should find that its ease of online use has been improved as part of the changes made to the MIB3 technology, which now features an online connectivity unit incorporating an integrated eSIM, meaning that if you wish, this Passat can be permanently online. That makes use of this infotainment system's upgraded functionality much easier. Things like internet radio that offers a choice of stations from all over the world. Uh, the way that passengers can connect their smart devices to the internet via a Wi-Fi hotspot. And the integration for the first time of built-in streaming music services like Apple Music and Tidal. Though you'll need to purchase in-card data for full use of them. If, as is probable, you're using this Passat as a business tool, you'll also find yourself making plenty of use of the WeConnect Plus vehicle and navigation-based services package, a three-year subscription to which is optional across the range. Amongst other things, this gives you online traffic information and route calculations, briefs you on petrol stations or parking spaces along your route, and allows you to preheat or pre-cool the cabin. Perhaps more noticeable MIB3 system changes include the way that screen functionality has evolved. The icons, for instance, can now be individually arranged, as on a smartphone. Plus, the navigation menu has been reconfigured, and points of interest features and online traffic data are now shown on the map. In addition, the App Connect setup that allows Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring is now of the wireless sort, which would completely eradicate the need to have unsightly leads flopping about the lower dash were it not for the fact that the USB uh, port is annoyingly of the USB-C variety, so this little converter lead in most cases will have to stay. Another screen in this car that Volkswagen's designers have spent a lot of time trying to improve is the one that you can option in to replace the conventional gauges of the instrument binnacle. This digital cockpit is only actually standard on the very priciest models. We've got it here. Uh, but it's certainly a feature worth having because the ordinary dial layout with its central trip computer screen now looks a little dated. 
This active info display is 10.25 inches in size and has been enhanced with better graphics and colors. It still works much as it did before with layouts that you can customize by clicking on this steering wheel view button. When two virtual dials are shown, the information within them can be tailored via a whole series of choices accessible via a setup menu offered within the settings of the center dash display. Click further on the view button and you'll find that you can remove the dials and expand the screen's central information section, displaying it with or without flanking tabs. This latter layout can be customized to show a full width navigation map. There's also a good buy screen and one with sign off data showing the average consumption figure for the journey you've just made, as well as the average speed, the distance traveled and the driving time. Enough on screens and media stuff. What more might you need to know about this interior? Well, we'll start with the fact that its Ergo Comfort driver's seat is, in our view, the most comfortable and supportive in the segment. Across the range, featuring lumbar adjustment, cushion tilt adjustment, special thigh support, and electric backrest adjustment. As a result, it cossets you better than any seat we've tried on a car in this class, which means that if you regularly cover long mileages, then this feature all on its own might be a major incentive to choose this Volkswagen. Further up the range, on this GTE model for instance, the Ergo Comfort package is embellished with niceties like 14-way powered adjustment and a massage function. The seat positioning is just one of the ways that the ergonomics of this cabin are pretty faultless. There's plenty of reach and height adjustment for the steering wheel and you'll also get this lovely height adjustable armrest that you can position to exactly suit the most comfortable possible position for your elbow. There are also few issues with all-round visibility thanks to the wide windows and upright pillars. Uh, though standard front and rear parking sensors are included just in case. What about cabin storage? Well, that armrest we just mentioned covers a deep central stowage area between the seats, which incorporates another USB-C port. The air conditioned glove box and the reasonably sized door bins are both decently sized and smartly flock lined, the door bins incorporating holders for one litre bottles. There's a stowage area ahead of the gear stick and another by the driver's right knee. There are also twin cup holders by the gear stick. And Volkswagen hasn't forgotten to add an overhead sunglasses compartment. There's a coin holder and a 12 volt socket behind the electronic handbrake switch um, along with a ticket clip on the driver's sun visor. Away from storage, we like little touches too. The LED ambient lighting strips in the doors, the dashboard and the footwell. And the way that the climate control system switches into air recirculation mode when the sat-nav informs it that you've entered a tunnel. Time to take a seat in the rear. Now, if you're familiar with the Passat, but for some reason haven't yet tried this post-2015 8th generation version, you might be favourably impressed at the amount of space on offer back here, enhanced by the lengthier wheelbase, it was increased by 79mm, and the extra 12mm of width that were incorporated into this B8 series design. It's still difficult to comfortably seat an adult in the middle though because of the height of this prominent raised centre transmission tunnel. But it's a significantly roomier space than it would be in a premium badge D-segment model like for instance uh, this car's Audi A4 close cousin. There's a greater level of media connectivity than usual back here. Pulling back on this central compartment lid reveals um, 12 volt and USB-C ports plus a 230 volt socket plus all the practical touches you'd want are included seat back pockets, overhead reading lights, rear climate controls with twin vents and no fewer than four coat hooks plus the door cards feature classy white stitching and incorporate decently sized door bins with bottle holders and there's a fold down central armrest with cup holders. Finally 
let's take a look out back at luggage space, which with this saloon version means pushing on this boot-mounted Volkswagen badge. With top spec variants like this one, an easy open power operation is included, enabling the trunk lid or the tailgate to be opened with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper if you find yourself approaching your Passat laden down with bags. This Volkswagen was the first car on the market to offer this feature. Once the boot is open, you'll find that it offers a very decent 586 litre capacity, though bear in mind that this falls to just 402 litres with this GTE plug-in model because of the batteries that must sit beneath the boot floor. Opt for the estate body style that Passat buyers tend to prefer, and you get 650 litres with a conventional engine, or 483 litres if you buy this car in GTE plug-in form. If you're happy with a conventionally engine Passat saloon, you'll enjoy significantly more boot space than would be available to you with competing models. To give you some class perspective, the 586 litre capacity figure just mentioned is 81 litres more than an Audi A4, 86 litres more than a BMW 3 Series, or if, as is more likely, your comparison point is with a D-segment saloon featuring a volume brand badge, 106 litres more than a Mazda 6. A Peugeot 508 offers 56 litres less. It's a usable space too, with four tie-down points, a 12-volt socket on the right, and this large pull-down hook, which retracts from the boot roof. A warning triangle is built into the inside of the boot lid, and there's a useful compartment on the right-hand side of the cargo area where you can house a first aid kit. But of course, if you don't happen to want a Passat estate, the fact that you have to have a saloon body shape with this Volkswagen might conceivably be an issue for a few potential buyers. Having a three-box body shape with a conventional trunk like this is, after all, a lot more restrictive in terms of what you can get in than would be the hatch arrangement offered as an alternative to an estate by a competing Mondeo Insignia or Skoda Superb. Still, in compensation, there's a ski hatch, so you can push longer items through into the cabin. You can fold the rear backrest via these boot roof mounted levers. They only fold in a 60-40 split, rather than the more useful 40-20-40 split that you get in a rival BMW 3 Series. But once everything's close to flat, you can potentially increase the boot space of this saloon to as much as 1,152 litres in a conventionally engined model. The estate version is, of course, more spacious still, its boot growing to 1,780 litres in size when the seat backs are retracted with a conventionally engine derivative. As ever, with this Volkswagen, prices sit somewhere between volume brand D-segment Mondeo class models and the premium brand contenders in this sector, typified by this car's Audi A4 cousin. At the time of the launch of this facelifted B8 series Passat in the autumn of 2019, things kicked off from just over £25,000 for this saloon version. You'll need to find a premium of around £2,000 if you're interested in the alternative estate body style that the majority of Passat buyers tend to want. As we'll see in a moment, there are eight trim levels on offer, with most sales based around the entry-level SE and SE Nav, or mid-level SEL variants. If you've more to spend, you can opt for a sportier-looking R-Line package, also available to estate buyers in even more exclusive R-Line edition form. If you are prepared to limit yourself to the estate, there's additionally an SUV-style all-track variant that comes with four-motion four-wheel drive, a raised ride height, and unique styling. Finally, there's this GTE plug-in model, which has its own standalone trim level and is offered in standard, or as in this case, plush GTE Advance forms. Let's consider the overall range structure and drill down into a bit of detail. Passat buyers tend to be more likely to want manual transmission than customers with some other brands in this model's D segment. And if that's the case for you, your choice is going to be limited to the two volume 150 PS engines that most customers choose, the 1.5 TSI petrol and the new 2 litre TDI Evo series 150 PS diesel. As you'd expect, for a little more, both these power plants can also be paired to Volkswagen's usual DSG auto gearbox, a 7-speeder, in this case for an extra payment of £1,600. 
Either way, the 1.5 TSI petrol unit offers a price saving of just under £2,000 over the 2 litre 150 PS diesel, which makes it well worth considering as an alternative if your annual mileage isn't especially high. The other thing that Passat buyers tend to prioritise a little more than those of other brands in this sector is running cost efficiency. And for folk of that sort, the Wolfsburg maker has two options to put to you with this car. One of them is this GTE petrol-electric plug-in hybrid model, only offered with a six-speed DSG auto gearbox. And it's a variant that Volkswagen now thinks will take around 30% of total Passat sales, even though this 218 PS powertrain no longer qualifies for a government grant and sells at hefty pricing in the 37,000 to 39,000 pound bracket. Should those figures be a little on the high side, you could find yourself instead looking at the kind of engine you might think would be more at home in a Golf. Uh, the little 1.6 litre TDI 120 PS diesel, which a little surprisingly can only be had paired with DSG auto transmission. The 1.6 TDI though is these days a relatively old tech power plant, which is why its efficiency figures are now outshone by the 2 litre TDI 150 PS Evo unit. If you're prepared to spend well over £30,000 on your Passat, you might want to know about a couple of 190 PS engines on offer further up the range to SEL and R-Line buyers. The 2 litre TSI 190 PS petrol unit will be a rare choice, but the old tech 2 litre TDI 190 PS diesel engine continues to have quite a strong following, particularly in the towing community. That's partly because of its gutsy 400 newton metre torque output, and partly because if you opt for R line trim, you can have your Passat 2 litre TDI 190 PS model incorporating the extra traction that comes with four motion four wheel drive for an extra payment of £2,280. Pounds. The SUV style all track estate variant we mentioned earlier, by the way, only comes in 2 litre TDI 190 PS form. Caravan owners should form an orderly queue. That's if they can't stretch to the top Passat engine, the Bi TDI 240 PS twin turbo version of the 2 litre TDI unit, which has to be had with the four motion setup. But in that form, this car would cost well over £40,000. As would the super rare top petrol unit, a 272 PS version of the 2 litre TSI engine, another power plant that has to be mated to four motion four wheel drive. In considering this Passat, it might be difficult for you to ignore the similarly priced, similarly sized crossover models that will be sitting on the other side of your local Volkswagen dealer's showroom. But could you really justify one of those in the face of the Passat value proposition? After all, a Passat estate is far more spacious than a Volkswagen Tiguan mid-sized SUV and in identically engined, comparably trimmed form should cost around £1,500 to £2,000 less. You could also argue that choosing a really top spec, all track spec or by TDI diesel engine Passat estate makes more sense than blowing 45,000 to 50,000 pounds on a lower order version of the Wolfsburg brand's largest SUV, the Touareg. But style, not sense, is currently what tends to drive sales in this part of the market, which is why SUVs are of much more importance to Volkswagen these days. But let's leave crossovers to the crossover crowd and consider the more natural, conventional, medium-range, Mondeo-class D-segment rivals this Passat must face from other brands. Having mentioned the Mondeo, let's start with that. If you were looking at this Passat in volume 2 litre TDI 150 PS diesel guys, you'll find that Ford priced at around £3,000 less but it'll cost you considerably more to run, hasn't the same interior quality and has a smaller boot. Two other really significant rivals threaten this Passat in this class. One is Vauxhall's Insignia, which can be even cheaper than a Mondeo, but can't match either the cabin quality or the media connectivity of a Passat. And the Vauxhall can no longer be ordered as an estate, so for many potential buyers of this Volkswagen, this will rule an Insignia out of contention right then and there. We think potential Passat buyers are more likely to be considering this Volkswagen's close cousin, the Skoda Superb, which shares all the same engineering you get here, but costs around £1,500 less when comparably spec'd. 
you could further boost that saving to around £2,500 if you were to consider that superb model with the kind of base S trim level that Volkswagen doesn't offer with a Passat now. Bear in mind that the Superb's alternative to an estate body style is a hatch body shape rather than the saloon format that you get here. Some consider a five-door format to be somehow less premium, though it's worth pointing out that in compensation you'll get significantly more rear cabin room and boot space in a Skoda Superb hatch than can be offered by a Passat saloon. A Superb estate is bigger than a Passat estate too. Despite that, there's actually relatively little customer crossover between the two models. Such is the appeal for Volkswagen's badge equity. That Skoda is, though, the only class competitor that can better this Passat's cabin and boot space. A rival Mazda 6 certainly can't compete on that score, though it's worth noting that that Japanese model has sharper handling than this Volkswagen and would, in comparable form, save you nearly a £1,000 up front to buy. A rival Peugeot 508 might be less tempting as a Passat alternative given its ambitious pricing and the French brand's less solid depreciation record. In base 1.5 blue HDI 130 diesel form, that 508 costs the same as a Passat 1.6 TDI. And in 2 litre blue HDI 160 auto form, a 508 costs around £600 more than a Passat 2 litre TDI 150 PS, comparably equipped with navigation. Beyond the Mondeo, the Insignia, the Superb, the Mazda 6 and the 508, there really isn't anything else you can look at in this class these days if you want a conventionally engined, volume branded, direct D-segment alternative to what's on offer here and don't want an SUV. Once upon a time, Hyundai, Kia, Renault, Citroen, Honda and Toyota all campaigned vigorously in this sector. Now they're all gone, thanks to the rise and rise of the ubiquitous crossover genre. You might, like us, be wondering just how much of a price step there'd be to go from a Passat to a D-segment model with a really posh premium badge. Say a model like this car's close cousin, the Audi A4, or perhaps a BMW 3 Series or a Mercedes C-Class. Well, with comparable engine sizes, anything between £5,000 to £10,000 is the answer to that question, depending on the rival you're looking at. Quite a price step, in other words which you might find difficult to stomach, given that in every case it gets you a car with a smaller boot and less rear cabin space. Before we finish our comparisons with other manufacturers, a word specifically about the price and positioning of the Passat GTE petrol plug-in model that we're looking at here, which, as we said earlier, cost, at the time of this test in early 2020, from around £36,500 in this saloon form, or from just over £38,000 as an estate. Exactly the same mechanical package is provided by Skoda's superb IV, at a saving of around £1,800. Aside from that car, the only volume branded plug-in rival to a Passat GTE is the Peugeot 508 Hybrid 225, which costs around £1,500 less. It's worth pointing out that Passat GTE pricing could almost get you a properly premium badged plug-in model in this segment. The BMW 330e only costs £1,200 more, though that price difference would certainly widen if you equipped that Bavarian model to this Volkswagen standard. The Mercedes plug-in alternative in this class, the C300DE EQ Power, is a diesel, not a petrol, so isn't really directly comparable. And anyway, that Merck's £43,000 list price means it'll cost you around £6,500 more. If you're not hung up on a full hybrid car of this kind being of the plug-in variety, then your D-segment options widen, and the price savings over a Passat GTE would be substantial. A Mondeo self-charging full hybrid would uh, cost you less than £27,000, while a Toyota Camry self-charging hybrid costs from around £30,000. But the Mondeo hybrid model isn't especially efficient, while a Camry only comes as a saloon. And anyway, self-charging hybrid power plants don't deliver the super low CO2 readings that make plug-in powertrains so cheap to tax. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a Passat that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Volkswagen has been with standard equipment. 
The brand has had to make a lot more effort in this respect with its more recent models. And sure enough, even in entry-level SE trim, this Volkswagen will come complete with quite a lot. So tick off 17-inch Istanbul design alloy wheels, uh, full LED headlamps, LED tail lights, front fog lamps, all-round parking sensors, ACC adaptive cruise control, auto headlamps and wipers, an alarm and a space saver spare wheel. On the inside, the highlight feature is Volkswagen's excellent Ergo Comfort multi-adjustable driver's seat with cushion tilt, lumbar adjustment and a powered backrest. Plus, a Passat SE will come with air conditioning, an auto-dimming rearview mirror, a multifunction trip computer, a first aid kit and a rear seat ski hatch. SE models also get a composition colour infotainment system with a 6.5 inch centre dash touchscreen, an 8 speaker DAB audio system and a wireless app connect package that without unsightly leads connects in your handset via either Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Go further and get yourself an SE NAV model and as the badging suggests that infotainment system will be upgraded to discover navigation status to include sat nav which means it'll also come with a larger 8 inch center dash screen. We also ought to mention that across the range this saloon body shape comes complete with split folding backrests while with the estate you get a variable height boot floor and roof rails too. As a buyer of this Volkswagen you also get free access to a WeConnect app via which you can remotely interact with your Passat accessing things like driving data and enabling light activation. At point of purchase, you'll be offered the option of upgrading this to WeConnect Plus, which, after payment of a three-year subscription fee, will enable you to go further. And again, via your smartphone, do things like preset cabin temperatures and lock or unlock the doors from wherever you happen to be in the world. Many Passat buyers will want to progress beyond SE spec. The next stop up in the range structure being SEL trim, recognisable outside by its smarter Neville's style 17 inch alloy wheels and inside by its Vienna leather upholstery. From this point on in the range, all Passat variants get the Discover navigation system with its 8 inch screen, plus rear privacy glass, uh, power folding mirrors and voice activation for the infotainment system. Is it worth upgrading further to sportier R-Line spec? Well, you might be tempted. This trim level gives you 18-inch Monterey alloy wheels, lowered sport suspension, and an R-Line styling pack for the bumpers and the radiator grille that also adds side skirts and a rear spoiler. Other R-Line niceties include branded seats trimmed in Napa leather with carbon optic side bolsters, uh, stainless steel pedals, three-zone climate control, ambient lighting, keyless entry, heated washer jets and powered easy open operation for the hatch or the boot lid that can be activated by a wave of your foot beneath the bumper. Those looking at the estate body style and wanting something even more exclusive were, at the time of this facelifted Mark 8 Passat model's launch, offered a limited run R-Line Edition model that for a hefty price premium added in quite a lot more. Passat enthusiasts will recognise this R-Line Edition variant, it's very rare, by its 19-inch Pretoria dark graphite alloy wheels and black exterior finishing for the front grille, lower bumper, side skirts and roof rails. Plus, Passat R-Line Edition customers get DCC, dynamic chassis control and the brand's clever IQ Light LED matrix headlight system along with a 360 degree area view surround view camera package, the active info display digital instrument binnacle screen and Volkswagen's upgraded Discover Navigation Pro infotainment setup with its 3D mapping and larger 9.2 inch screen. We should also cover off the two standalone Passat variants that we mentioned at the beginning. Here, as we said, we've got the GTE plug-in version, recognisable by its blue brake calipers and unique C-signature front LED daytime running lights. Plus, the GTE package gives you blue ambient lighting and the luxury features of mid-range SEL trim, 
uh, three zone climate control, for instance. A specific feature for the GTE powertrain is a tailored version of Volkswagen's driver profile selection setup, which with this plug-in model features an electrified E-mode, plus further modes for hybrid driving and battery charging, along with a battery hold mode and a sporty GTE mode. We've got the plusher GTE Advance model here, which as well as all that, adds in larger 18-inch Monterey grey metallic alloy wheels, the IQ Light LED matrix headlight system, the Active Info Display digital instrument binnacle, the powered Easy Open Auto Tailgate or Boot Release setup, keyless entry, and the Discover Navigation Pro infotainment setup with its 9.2-inch screen. Finally, there's the SUV-style all-track estate, offered only with the estate body style and the 2.0-litre TDI 190 PS diesel engine mated to four-motion four-wheel drive. This variant features off-road suspension and a 27.5mm increase in ride height, plus an off-road drive mode setting and a hill descent control system. Along with anthracite coloured wheel arch protectors and side sill protectors, 18 inch Collata alloy wheels, uniquely shaped all track style bumpers, a full size spare wheel and special upholstery. Enough with standard spec, what about options? We've already mentioned a few of the key ones. Unfortunately, it's not possible to affordably add in the active info display digital instrument binnacle setup on its own. That has to be had as part of an expensive package costing £2,200 that combines this feature alongside the Discover Navigation Pro infotainment system with its larger 9.2-inch centre dash screen. Another pricey extra is the IQ Light LED matrix headlight system, but that £1,500 setup is undoubtedly very clever in the way that it predicts the kind of light beam you're going to need, tailoring it for your surroundings. An option to choose if someone else is paying, perhaps. You might say the same about DCC Dynamic Chassis Control, which allows you to tailor ride quality to your preferences and will cost you around £900 more unless you've chosen the very fastest petrol and diesel engines. We suggest you avoid the other damping option, that for passive firmed up sports suspension, which doesn't do this Passat supple ride quality any favours. If you like your driving, better to opt instead for the XDS electronic differential lock, which is there to reduce understeer and give you more stability when cornering. Plus, it stops one driven wheel spinning faster than the other, as it might, for example, when you were powering away across wet leaves. What else? A heated steering wheel or a head-up display, perhaps? A panoramic glass roof and some sort of ambient lighting package, maybe? On mainstream models, we'd be tempted to pay extra for the 14-way powered Ergo Comfort driver's seat with its massage and memory functions. On the SE and SEL variants, there's plenty else you can add. Things like three-zone climate control, keyless entry, and the easy open system for the powered boot lid or tailgate. On one of the SE models, you might want to pay extra for Vienna leather upholstery too. On to aesthetics. Bear in mind that unless you're going to order your Passat in solid Urano grey, you'll be paying your dealer more for your choice of paint shade. Appallingly, even bog standard solid pure white, which is what we've got here, costs more. Beyond that, there's a range of metallic and pearl effect shades, a new metallic signature colour, Lapis Blue, an ultra metallic shade, Aquamarine Blue, and a premium signature colour, Oryx White. To set off your chosen colour, you might want to peruse Volkswagen's range of optional 17, 18 or 19 inch alloy wheels, should you not like the ones fitted with your chosen trim level. For the inside, buyers who've avoided R-Line spec might want to add in a black roof lining. We'll finish our look at options with a review of extra cost practical items. If, like most Passat buyers, you've chosen the estate body style, it's very possible that you're going to want to add the optional tow bar, which can be of the swivelling or detachable kind. Go for that, and ideally, you'd also specify the trailer assist system, which helps you hook up to and reverse with something you're towing, automatically controlling the difficult bit, the steering. 
Now, for anyone who's ever made a complete mess of reversing a trailer in front of an audience, that'll be well worth the asking price. Talking of parking aids, there's a rear view camera, a park assist system to steer you into spaces, and an area view 360 degree surround camera setup. It would also be wise to upgrade the standard space saver spare wheel to a full sized one. Bear in mind that no kind of spare can be had with the GTE plug-in models, nor, annoyingly, can you have any sort of spare wheel if you upgrade to the optional 16-channel, 700-watt, Dyne Audio Confidence 10-speaker sound system. You can also opt for roof bars, which will then enable you to fit a roof box or perhaps a holder for a surfboard or a kayak. A ski and snowboard holder will take up to six pairs of skis or four snowboards, or you could attach a bicycle rack to the roof. Another bike carrier can fit over the tow bar at the back. Mud flaps are also available, and you can protect the luggage area with a rubber boot mat, a luggage compartment liner, and rear bumper protection film. You can add in a luggage net too. Enough with options, let's take a look at driver assist systems and safety provision. Quite a lot's changed in terms of the driver assist features available on this car, all of which are grouped under Volkswagen's IQ Drive umbrella brand. Now that adaptive cruise control and lane assist, adaptive lane guidance are both standard across the range, quite a few more IQ Drive elements can be offered, and the one the company is most keen to promote is its latest travel assist system, which enables so-called level two autonomous driving at high speeds. It's basically a development of the previous traffic jam assist setup, but whereas that automatic longitudinal and lateral guidance system could only be used at up to 37 miles an hour, Travel Assist can completely control the car for you at speeds of up to 130 miles an hour. That's providing you keep your hands on the new capacitive steering wheel, though we read recently that taping an uncooked sausage to the steering wheel rim would be enough to fool the system's sensors into thinking you were holding it. Perhaps a little more development is needed there. Another nice feature now built into the ACC Adaptive Cruise Control System is Predictive Cruise Control, which uses images from a windscreen camera along with navigation data to adjust the car's speed ahead of bends and speed restrictions. Plus, of course, ACC can do all the usual things, adapting your Passat speed to the vehicles ahead and in the event of a tailback, bringing the car to a controlled stop and starting it off again without driver input. If your Passat has DSG Auto Transmission, it'll also now come with a clever emergency assist system, which can take over driving duties completely should you become incapacitated, steering the car to the side of the road and bringing it to a safe and gradual stop. What else? Uh, well, you'd expect some sort of autonomous braking system on a car of this kind these days. Volkswagen's is called Front Assist, and as usual with these sorts of setups, it scans the road ahead as you drive. If a potential collision hazard is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. For this revised B8 series model, this setup's city emergency braking system has been enhanced with predictive pedestrian protection, which is more specifically able to identify people or cyclists who might be about to inadvertently step into your path. Should this sort of situation happen, or if, for instance, another driver suddenly brakes in front of you, further help is provided by an emergency steering assist system that's automatically activated as soon as you have to avoid an obstacle. After visual and, and uh, acoustic warnings, this will introduce targeted braking intervention from the assistance system that'll help stabilise the car should you have to perform an evasive manoeuvre. All of this is in addition to all the more usual features that come fitted across the Passat range, which have helped to justify this car's five-star Euro NCAP safety test showing. There are seven airbags, including two that run the length of the cabin at window level and one beneath the steering column to protect the driver's knees. 
You also get Isovic's child seat fastenings on the rear bench. And we like the inclusion of an automatic post-collision braking system that recognises when an impact has occurred and brakes the car to prevent it being uncontrollably propelled into oncoming traffic. It's also worth mentioning that one of the features of the WeConnect app we mentioned earlier is an emergency call e-call system that in the event of an accident where the airbags are triggered will automatically alert the rescue services with your exact GPS location. Other conventional safety features include the normal ESC stability control and ASR traction control systems, plus MSR engine braking control that will stop you skidding if you change down abruptly on a slippery surface. If you do get into a skid, a DSR steering assistance feature will help you steer out of it. And you get an ABS braking system further assisted by CBC cornering brake control through the bends. Plus an HBA hydraulic braking assistant, which helps reduce stopping time when you really slam on the anchors in an emergency. Plus all Passats get a hill hold function to stop you from drifting backwards on an uphill junction. And a driver alert system that will warn you if sensors detect drowsiness. The usual tyre pressure sensors are standard with a full tyre pressure monitoring system on the options list. Another welcome standard safety feature is what Volkswagen calls proactive occupant protection which uses sensors from the front assist setup to prepare the car to help you survive an impact if those sensors deem a collision to be inevitable. That'll mean your belts will be instantly pre-tensioned while the windows and the sunroof if fitted will be immediately closed. It's all very reassuring. At the original launch of this 8th generation V8 series Passat, Volkswagen put considerable efforts into creating a product with a core level of efficiency that would keep its running costs competitive throughout its life cycle. Hence the cleverness of the high-tech MQB platform introduced into this Mark 8 design, which reduced the curb weight by 85 kilograms. This attribute combining with the benefits of the blue motion technology that Volkswagen applied across the range. All of this meant then, and pretty much means now, that a Passat doesn't really cost much more to run than a Golf. As with the latest version of that car, all the engines in this Passat, including the TSI petrol units, now have particulate filters as standard fit. When this 8th generation model first arrived back in 2014, the brand tried to tempt efficiency-minded buyers with a Blue Motion variant, which boosted the frugality of the base 1.6-litre diesel derivative with low rolling resistance tyres and special aerodynamic parts. These days, thankfully, the engineering which aims to improve the fuel and CO2 figures of this car is of the far more fundamental kind. And, as you'd want, all the power plants now conform to the industry's most stringent Euro 6D Temp RDE Step 1 compliance standard. In this film, we briefed you on the new 2.0-litre TDI 150 PS diesel engine's Evo series redesign, its cylinder deactivation plus its new exhaust, turbo fuel injection and thermos management systems, all changes aimed at driving down running costs. Plus, there's so-called twin-dosing catalytic converter technology, which reduced NOx emissions by up to 80% compared to the previous engine. The result sees a typical Passat saloon fitted with this Evo power plant and a DSG auto gearbox return up to 55.2 miles to the gallon on the combined WLTP cycle and up to 106 grams per kilometre of any DC rated CO2. Despite the Passat's lack of the kind of 12 volt mild hybrid technology that you get in a directly comparable Audi A4 35 TDI, the 2 litre TDI 150 PS version of this Volkswagen is able to almost directly replicate that Audi's fuel figure. And it betters the figures that you get from a Passat fitted with the feebler 1.6 TDI 120 PS diesel, which with the DSG Auto box returns up to 51.4 miles to the gallon and up to 105 grams per kilometre in four-door form. To beat the 2-litre Evo diesel's frugality in this Volkswagen, you have to opt for something quite different, the clever GTE petrol plug-in hybrid version that we're trying here. 
if you viewed other sections of this film, you'll know that this mates a 1.4 litre TSI petrol engine with an 85 kilowatt electric motor powered by a now larger 13 kilowatt hour battery, which when fully charged can now provide up to 36 miles of all electric WLTP rated driving range. That's a 30% improvement equating to an enhancement in range of about 12 miles. As a result, it's quite likely that with a typical commute, a Passat GTE owner would only need to actually visit a fuel station every month or two. Assuming you install the 3.6 kilowatt wall box charger in your garage, the battery can be replenished from empty in three and a half hours. From an ordinary household plug, the charging time figure rises to around five hours. The result of all this technology is a faintly ludicrous WLTP combined cycle fuel economy figure of up to 235.4 miles to the gallon and a super clean NEDC rated CO2 output of up to 32 grams per kilometre. These readings are based around a standard GTE saloon being used in its most frugal hybrid driving mode. Of course, in the real world, a GTE won't deliver readings anything like these, but the important thing is that the government believes them. Hence, this variance, super affordable 16% benefiting kind taxation positioning. A comparable 2 litre TDI 150 PS diesel model is rated at 28%, and the GTE gets a low VED band B rating. That of course means significant company car tax savings. A slight downside with this GTE variant lies with the fact that the battery's positioning under the rear seat necessitates a reduction in fuel tank size from 66 to 50 litres. But even so, with a fully charged battery and a full tank of fuel, a range of over 620 miles ought to be possible. So for example, you could travel from London to Paris and back without refueling. But to do that, you'll need to use the various provided drive modes proactively and keep an eye on the various provided e-displays. There's an electric range monitor plus an interactive energy flow diagram which shows at any time what's being powered by what. Plus there's a zero emission screen which briefs you on the amount of fully electrified mileage that you've completed since the start of your journey. Regardless of the kind of instrument binnacle you've opted for with your GTE, there'll be a left-hand dial that'll give you green charge and blue percentage power sections to help you drive more economically. The car will always start off in fully electrified E-mode uh, before switching to a hybrid mode that sees the electric motor and the combustion engine combining together. You can also uh, select an E-mode to keep it in battery-powered motion. Now, as part of the hybrid setting, you've also a battery hold option that will save battery charge until later in your trip, and a battery charge setting in which the battery will be charged by the TSI engine as you drive. If you can't quite stretch to a Passat GTE and want to stick with petrol power, the version of this car you'll be considering is the 1.5 TSI. This unit hasn't been embellished with fashionable mild hybrid tech, but it does still feature active cylinder technology that under light throttle loads cuts off the second and the third cylinders for greater efficiency. As a result, a manual gearbox Passat 1.5 TSI saloon can deliver up to 47.1 miles to the gallon on the WLTP combined cycle and up to 117 grams per kilometre of any DC rated CO2, which is a very reasonable showing for a car of this size. With the DSG Auto gearbox that likely owners of this derivative are probably more likely to want, the figures are 44.8 miles to the gallon and 117 grams per kilometre. Opt for any of the other engines on offer, all of which are mated to a DSG Auto gearbox, and your Passat will cost significantly more to run. As before, we'll give you figures for saloon models on the smallest available wheels and use WLTP readings for fuel and any DC cycle returns for CO2, since that's what most competitors uh, most commonly tend to quote. The 2 litre TDI 190 PS diesel model, this the older non-Evo generation unit, manages up to 49.6 miles to the gallon and 116 grams per kilometre, or up to 47.1 miles to the gallon and up to 126 grams per kilometre in auto 4 motion form. For the 2 litre by TDI 4 motion 240 PS diesel, the readings are up to 39.8 miles to the gallon and up to 148 grams per kilometre. What about the faster petrol models? 
well. The alternative 2-litre TSI 190 PS petrol derivative manages up to 37.7 miles to the gallon and up to 140 grams per kilometre. While the super rare top 2 litre TSI 272 PS 4 motion R line edition estate variant manages 33.2 miles to the gallon and 162 grams per kilometre. Now, bear in mind that the readings we've been quoting will, as usual, be fractionally affected if you go for the heavier estate body style. And as you'd expect, it will slightly fall again if you're tempted by the larger optional alloy wheels. Across the range, the usual efficiency tweaks contribute to these figures. There's an energy recovery setup to reclaim energy that would otherwise be lost under braking or during cruising. And the usual start-stop system to cut the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. With the diesels, you'll need to keep the 16.3 litre tank for the necessary AdBlue additive topped up to keep within sight of the quoted readings. Of course, the figures you'll achieve will depend to a great extent on how you drive, another area in which this Passat aims to assist you. If you have a variant with the drive mode selection setup, you'll have the option of an eco setting that'll tweak all of the car's systems for ultimate frugality. That's just a start though. Across the range, the center dash infotainment screen includes a think blue trainer in its vehicle section, a display that gives you three circular dials that help with different areas of driving efficiency. The center one has two blue arcs in its outer ring and you have to stay within these by braking and accelerating carefully. If you do, you'll achieve a higher so-called blue driving score, rated on a scale of 0 to 100 and shown in the left-hand circle, or graphically via a separately selectable blue score overview. Do well here and the average fuel consumption figure shown in the right-hand circle will of course rise, and a touch of this round graphic will take you to a graph showing your average fuel consumption over the last 30 minutes. There's also the option of accessing a series of Think Blue fuel saving tips. Though to be frank, some of these are rather blindingly obvious. Opt for a model fitted with the active info display instrument binnacle screen and you can also bring fuel consumption readings right into your line of sight as you drive. Can you be bothered with all this? If you can't, it's no good complaining that the quoted running cost figures don't match those you actually achieve. The other cost-related facts surrounding this Volkswagen, though, are rather more straightforward. You can expect some of the highest residual values available in the class. Uh, to be specific, industry experts suggest that you should comfortably manage to get between 35 and 41% of a Passat Saloon's original purchase price back after a typical three-year, 36,000-mile operating period. For the estate, the figures are 33 to 43%. You won't be surprised to learn that this is a far better showing than you get with rival Mondeos and Insignias. What might be a little more shocking though is how close these residuals get to the kinds of returns that you get with a comparably engined posh premium badged D-segment mid-sized executive model like say an Audi A4 or a BMW 3 Series. We should give you a feel for your potential insurance costings too. The base 1.5 TSI petrol model is rated at Group 27 for the saloon and Group 28 for the estate. For the 1.6 TDI diesel, it's Group 29 for the saloon and Group 30 for the estate. The volume 2 litre TDI 150 PS diesel engine is rated at between Groups 28 and 29. The faster 2 litre TDI 190 PS diesel engine is rated at between Groups 31 and 33. And for this GTE petrol plug-in hybrid, groupings are 26E for the standard version and 28E for the plusher GTE Advanced model. That only leaves the top diesel, uh, the 240 PS by TDI 4 motion model rated at Group 37, and the two top petrol models, the 2 litre TSI 190 PS version, which is Group 32, and the rare 2 litre TSI 4 motion 272 PS R line edition variant rated at Group 36. As for servicing, well, as usual with Volkswagen models, there's a choice of either fixed or flexible maintenance packages. 
you'll choose the fixed approach if you cover less than 10,000 miles a year. And with this, the car will typically be looked at every 12 months. If your daily commute is more than 25 miles and your Passat will regularly be driven on longer distance journeys, you'll be able to work with a flexible regime that can see you travelling up to 18,000 miles or so between garage visits or every two years, whichever is sooner. What else? Well, we like the fact that misfueling protection is standard across the range, so you won't be able to accidentally put petrol in your diesel Passat. Uh, less impressive is the three-year 60,000 mile warranty cover. We really can't see why Volkswagen couldn't extend that mileage limit to 100,000 miles since that's what you get on its mechanically very similar Caddy van model. Uh, doing that though wouldn't give Volkswagen dealers so much of an opportunity to sell extended warranty packages. There's one for four years and 75,000 miles or if you plan to see a bit more of the world in your Passat there's a five-year, 90,000-mile package. Whatever your decision, your car will come with three years of pan-European roadside assistance that has no mileage restriction. The paintwork warranty lasts for three years, and as you'd expect, this car is protected by a 12-year anti-corrosion package. The Passat GTE has a separate eight-year battery warranty, which covers the battery for up to 100,000 miles. For five decades, Volkswagen's Passat has been the quality choice in the medium-range Mondeo segment. It's a model that for many bridges the gap between the type of company or family car they might feel they have to drive, something like a Mondeo or an Insignia, and the BMW 3 Series style compact executive saloon they'd really rather have. Volkswagen knows that the mainstream brand segment of this market sector is dying, which is why this Passat is being made ever more a premium product. All its rivals are trying to do the same thing, but this, as ever, is the car that gets closest to more affordably replicating the offerings of the Porsche badges. Its advantage over the best of its direct mainstream competitors, though, is slimmer than it's ever been. The latest versions of the Peugeot 508 and the Skoda Superb run it very close indeed. Hence the significance of the mild package of changes visited upon this 8th generation model. We're impressed with the media and driver assistance upgrades, but as usual with updates, it's the engine changes which are most significant. This GTE plug-in model's extra range is enough to potentially make the difference between a part-electrified commuting week and a fully battery-powered one. And the efficient new 2.0-litre TDI 150 PS Evo engine proves there's still a strong case for diesel derivatives in this part of the market. You'll need to be prepared to pay quite a bit more than you would for an equivalent Mondeo, Insignia or Superb. And if you're not buying the estate, this saloon body style is significantly less versatile than the hatch format that you get with those cars. The kind of sharp handling you get in, say, a Mazda 6 or in the premium badge models in this sector isn't really on the agenda either. But in compensation, there's supple ride quality, excellent refinement, class-leadingly comfortable seats, and brilliant build quality. All the things, in fact, that an aspiring middle management buyer with long distances to travel is likely to prioritise. This is, in every sense, a car that knows its market. <laughs>